speak now to uh, Al Jazeera's Jackie Ronan. I think she was trying to listen in to that um, press conference with me. Jackie, I don't know whether you agree with me, but what the Qatari Prime Minister seemed to be saying was that the resolution agreed that, uh, that the Arab League would recognise the Syrian National Coalition as the legitimate representat representatives of the Syrian opposition and a main interlocutor for Syrians in the Arab League, stopping short of full recognition. Did you understand that to be the case? Yes, I mean, there was like a translation and then there was uh, like a hasty rewording that we heard. I think really what it boils down to is exactly the form of words that was hammered out at this meeting. Obviously, the Gulf countries uh, led by Qatar were very keen to have that uh, clear, unequivocal recognition of the national coalition as the representative, the legitimate representative of the Syrian people right from the start. But the reason that this meeting has dragged on so long is that there was not a consensus on that. And in particular, um, I've heard that Iraq and Algeria had reservations about making it so um, unequivocal this kind of wording. So at one stage we were hearing a wording that was going to recognise them as something like the representative of the aspirations of the Syrian people. But then during the questioning, you know, that we've just heard now, when the journalists actually started to, if you like, interrogate the people up on the podium, we did hear him repeat very clearly again the legitimate representative of the of the Syrian people. He spelt it out twice. So it would appear um, on the basis of this news conference that in fact uh, that um, very much the objective being pushed by the Qataris who after all brokered this um, agreement uniting the Syrian opposition and the Gulf countries um, as a whole. It seems that their um, argument, if you wish, has actually won the day um, in terms of bringing uh, those wavering countries on board with this kind of wording, uh, recognising, providing this new united Syrian opposition group with the first um, formal expression of recognition from outside. And that's an important step um, for the Syrian opposition in actually trying to now move forward and gain more tangible forms of support. And when you're talking about tangible forms of support, basically we're talking here finance and weapons, aren't we? We're talking weapons, uh, we're talking money, um, we're also talking um, the kind of measures that might be put into place to, for example, ensure humanitarian corridors, no-fly zones, all of this kind of nuts and bolts. But yes, we're talking weapons and there has been a lot of talk about weapons. We heard um, in one of the earlier statements he made to Al Jazeera following his nomination, we heard the leader of the National Coalition, um, Muadha Al-Khatib, saying that Syria already had, or the opposition already had, um, has he rather enigmatically put it, friends who were going to help them without naming any names. And we've heard also um, in an interview with the uh, Qatari Minister of State for Foreign Affairs again underlining that once the Syrian National Coalition has international recognition, that gives it uh, the authority, the legitimacy, uh, it gives it a mandate, if you like, to actually go out and seek uh, really tangible, practical forms of support to actually go out there and say, we have an international mandate, uh, we are recognized, uh, therefore, you know, we are the army in waiting, we have the right to seek weaponry. So all of this recognition, if you, if you like, it's not just diplomatic niceties, it's not just political, it has very direct uh, military ramifications and with the correct international um, oversight, if you like, with the correct kind of international legitimacy, then it can make a real difference to the ability of the military opposition on the ground to increase uh, its resources and therefore increase its effectiveness in the fight against the government forces of Bashar al-Assad. For the moment, Jackie Rowland in Cairo, thanks very much indeed for that. And to discuss the developments inside Syria and those diplomatic moves by the Arab League, I'm joined in the studio now by Michael Weiss. He's a Syria expert at the Henry Jackson Society. That is a UK foreign policy think tank. Good to have you with us. Um, so the Syrian National Council uh, Coalition doesn't now appear to have some sort of recognition right. by the Arab League. We're not entirely sure exactly what it is because the translation was, was quite difficult to, to do. Sure. Um, 
But I guess the question is, is how does that mandate translate to those fighters on the ground? Well, that's the $64,000 question. I mean, the coalition, which was pretty much shoehorned into place, uh, this, this meeting, there were actually two separate meetings going on in Doha in the past week. One was by the Syrian National Council. Uh, which was struggling desperately to, to regain the legitimacy it was going to lose by the nomination of this new body, uh, in which it, it has one third of the seats, but not you know the full control. Uh, and then, in addition to that, there was this the so-called Syrian National Initiative, which was trying to bring together all these opposition groups. Now, the Syrian National Council has claimed that it controls the vast majority of military councils and, and sort of the armed opposition inside Syria. So if it's not fully in control of this new body, there's a question, a, a, a very strong ambiguity as to what the real connection between the political and the military wings of the opposition are. I've talked to several rebels today, in fact, who say this is nonsense. We don't recognize the Syrian National Council. This coalition, whilst it's a step in the right direction, particularly the senior figures who have been appointed to sort of the apex of it, the, the president and it's his two. It's more two, inclusive, isn't it's it? It's more inclusive. Uh, Suhair Atassi, this is a woman who was violently abused in February of 2011, dragged by the hair by Mukhabarat agents in Damascus. I mean, she's a credible feminist, secular Syrian. Uh, Mr. Khatib is a widely respected cleric. So these are these are steps in the right direction. But again, there are rebels on the ground I've spoken to today who say, look, nobody represents us. We represent ourselves. The military councils, which the SNC claims to sort of have ties to, uh, represent between 20 to 30 percent of the armed fighting forces. So how does the SNC then go about trying to bring those factions on board? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, they're not in the country for a start at the moment. They're, right. they're outside of the country, effectively, as it were, right. in exile. How do they go about reaching out to these fighters on the ground? And there are many, many groups, aren't there? There are, and they're increasing all the time. And there are some, such as Jabhat al-Nusra, which is a hardcore jihadist group that answers to nobody but itself. Look, at the end of the day, it comes down to money, even more so than weapons. Uh, from day one, if you talk to the rebels, they'll say, if we had cash, we could own Syria tomorrow because we can effectively buy the weapons we want from the regime, which is so corrupted that it's selling us ammunitions and bullets when it's not allowing us to take over air bases and to sack uh, barracks in Mukhabarat headquarters, uh, or we can buy them from arms dealers on the black market. The problem is, and I think this goes to your question of why the Arab League seems to be somewhat muddled in its terminology, there's a war going on. There's, there's various different forms of pressure being brought to bear on the opposition. The United States and European powers are still committed to what they call the political solution for Syria. They want a transitional government, one that doesn't include Bashar al-Assad at the helm, but one that can, includes the sort of institutions of the Syrian state, from the intelligence to the military to security forces. The Qataris and the Turks want a military solution. In fact, this week you saw Turkey rather forcefully ask NATO yet again Please provide us with Patriot missiles that we can station at the border. Now, here's another $64,000 question. How do you do a no-fly zone without aircraft, which NATO says it doesn't want to provide? Patriot missiles is a good way to do it. Turkey wants to create a no-fly zone in the north, a safe zone. The Qataris want to run weapons. So effectively, the political opposition, I mean, I have sympathy for them. We've been hearing for a year, these guys can't get their act together. They're hopelessly divided. Well, one of the reasons they're hopelessly divided is the, the different international partners and players have been pushing different agendas. And this is best reflected, I think, in the Arab League today. You have Iraq and Algeria. Iraq is still... Uh, in thrall, let's say, to, to the, the, the government in Iran in, in various respects, not wanting to commit fully to regime change in Syria, has not really backed the revolution, has been facilitating the transfer of agents and weapons from Iran to help the Assad regime. Algeria always is a spoiler when it comes to these sorts of things. In Lebanon, it's run by a coalition government uh, which consists of Hezbollah, which is obviously very pro-Assad. So with, even within the Arab bloc, there are divisions of opinion. Many of the fighters on the ground who do subscribe to the new Syrian National Coalition yep. may be thinking, great, we've got recognition now from the Gulf Corporation Council, right. we've got some sort of recognition from the Arab League, thinking that it's going to pave the way for weapons to, to come in in their masses to the country from yeah. the international community. How likely is that? I wouldn't hold my breath. Um, there is still a grave concern about which elements on the ground are going to be in possession of these weapons. I've been hearing for weeks, if not months, that, uh, well, they've got Stinger missiles. Well, if they had Stinger missiles, why aren't they shooting them to take down airplanes and helicopters? They're using guns to do that. Um, I, I don't think this is going to sort of uh, unleash the floodgates, so to speak, of, of advanced weaponry. In fact, the United States has been very clear that they're not willing to provide it. By the way, Robert Ford, uh, there was a Reuters article yesterday upon the announcement of, of this new coalition, was telling the SNC days ago 
guess what, guys? Even though Obama got term two, we're not doing military intervention in Syria. So I think, you know, what we're looking at here is sort of halfway measures. As I mentioned, Turkey pursuing its own, own national security interest to protect its border and possibly carve out a, a minimal safe zone in the north. The Qataris and, and probably even the Saudis trying to run guns to various factions on the ground. But I don't think that this is going to lead to the kind of solution that most Syrians have been asking for for, well, if not 20 months, then 15 months, let's say. Michael Weiss, really good to get your uh, thoughts sure. on the latest issues. Thanks so much. Pleasure.